<clears throat> the speaker is Professor Eric Kreisler. He will speak on uh, the Furstenberg Zimmer structure theory revisited. Please. Yes, thank you very much for the kind introduction. I will share my screen so that you can see what I write down. <clears throat> So you should now all see my screen, hopefully. Okay. So, um, yeah, as you said, I want to speak about today, I want to revisit the classical result from ergodic theory, the so-called Furstenberg Zimmer structure theorem. And I will tell you later on what this has to do with uh, yeah, groups and semi-groups on uh, of operators. But yeah, we will come to that later. Let me start with some motivation or basically, yeah, or yeah, I should mention first that this is based on a joint uh, work with Nikola Ediko from the University of Zurich and Markus Hase from Kiel. But yeah, I want to start with some motivation and some historical background because uh, one of the main applications of this uh, Furstenberg Zimmer structure theorem is Furstenberg's approach to Semeridis theorem from number theory. So I actually start with some number theory here. Uh, some number theoretic result. So this is Simeridis theorem. Theorem. And what is it about? Well, it is a statement about subsets of the positive integers. So let me start with such a set in the positive integers or natural numbers. And we assume that it is not too small in the sense that it has positive upper density. So I look at the following numbers. I look at A intersected with the first N numbers divided by the total amount of numbers in that interval. And then I take the limb sup for N to infinity. And this should be larger than zero. So asymptotically, my set should be large. And under this assumption, Semeridis theorem tells that I already find a lot of structure in my set A. Uh, in the sense that there are arithmetic progressions of arbitrary length. So I will write down what that means. That means if I take any number k, then I find a starting number a and a distance d such that um, a, a plus d, a plus 2d, and so on, are all contained in my set a. So until a plus k minus 1d, these are all in A. So in other words, I find uh, K numbers in A, which all have the same distance to each other. So this is uh, yeah, a very nice number theorem. But uh, yeah, Fürstenberg uh, had an ergodic theoretic approach to this result, an ergodic theoretic proof, uh, and actually translated this into a statement about measure preserving systems. So uh, this is equivalent to a statement about measure preserving transformations, um, namely a statement about recurrence or more precisely multiple recurrence. Doesn't really matter what precisely is uh, meant here, but uh, yeah, more or less recurrence uh, says um, that you can come back in your system. So you start somewhere and after some time you come back to your original uh, position in, yeah, at least approximately. And um, yeah, this statement about multiple recurrence is now for, for measure preserving systems. So measure preserving systems x phi. And what do I mean by that? Well, x is just some uh, probability space and phi is a measurable and measure preserving map on that space. So measure, measure preserving and in this talk, I will also usually assume that it is invertible up to null sets. So I will write this down as essential, essentially invertible. So this is, these are uh, the classical objects of ergodic theory. You have these measure preserving systems. You have probability spaces and transformations on probability spaces and you study their properties. And this uh, correspondence principle due to Fürstenberg tells that uh, number theoretic results are, can be sometimes um, treated with, with the help of ergodic theory, with this study of measure preserving system. 
okay, but of course, if you want to prove Semmerini theorem using ergodic theory, you then still have to prove this multiple recurrence result here. And here, uh, a second key idea of first back comes into play uh, together with, uh, so he developed this together with Katz and Bronstein, and he gave a very nice proof of this multiple recurrence result. And let me sketch this idea. So how do you prove this multiple recurrence result? And a general measure preserving system might be very complicated. So you can imagine any measure map on any probability space. It's rather a large class of systems. But what you can do is you can look at uh, more manageable factors of your system. So instead of looking at your entire system x phi, we look at a, at a factor of that. And the most trivial factor of it all is just you take one point with an identity map. So this is, of course, a measure preserving system with just a trivial measure on a point. And you can, this is a factor of your original system if you map everything to one point. So of course, you can map everything to one point. So this gives you a factor of your original uh, dynamical system. And of course, for or not of course, but it's not that hard to see that for a trivial system, most statements are also trivial to prove. So uh, this multiple recurrence is really true for a trivial system. That's not hard to see. Um, and now the idea is to use some kind of inductive argument. So we start with a system where we already know that multiple recurrence is, is there. And now we try to uh, rebuild our entire system step by step from factors. So we look at large and larger factors um, until we finally arrive at our original system at some point. And we do this in a useful way, not in a stupid way. We want to do this. Uh, so we want to build a tower of factors of our original system such that we can really lift this multiple recurrence property from one step to the next. So such that uh, if X alpha phi alpha, if some factor has this multiple recurrence property, whatever that is precisely, but this is the idea. We want to lift multiple recurrence or any property really. We want to uh, lift the property from one step to the next in this tower. So build this tower of factors in such a way that we can do an induction in the end. So this is the idea of the proof. So this was really uh, yeah, the key or the nice idea of them. Um, but yeah, now here really the first maximal structure theorem, the uh, thing I want to talk about today comes into play because it says that such a tower can actually be constructed. So you can actually find such a tower of uh, factor maps or factors. And it says even more, it says that any measure preserving system can be rebuilt by a trip from a trivial system. So from the most simple systems you can imagine by only performing basically two kinds of constructions or extensions as they are called in ergodic theory. Namely, you have some sort of chaotic construction or extension, the so-called weakly mixing extensions. And on the other hand, you have structured extensions, which come under different names in the literature, for example, um, extensions with relative discrete spectrum, compact extensions, or isometric extensions. But they are all basically the same thing. But yeah, in essence, you only need two kinds of constructions. You need some chaotic form of construction and some structured form of construction. Okay, but uh, yeah, the essence of this uh, uh, this uh, first maximal result comes down actually to a dichotomy result, and I want to write this down because this is really the key to uh, yeah to the first maximal structure theorem, and then also to Semmerides theorem if you prove it in this ergodic uh, theoretic fashion. So what is this uh, dichotomy result? And I will call this the firstenberg zimmer dichotomy, FZ dichotomy. So what does it tell? It tells us, yeah, of course, it's a result, a dichotomy result. So there should be two, two possibilities, two alternatives. 
And what we start with is a factor map of dynamical systems. So we take a measure preserving system and we take a morphism, an extension or a factor map, if you will, to another dynamical system, which we call Z theta. So we have two measure preserving systems and a map between them. And now, uh, so let me write this down, maybe and call this a factor map factor map of measure preserving systems. And then exactly one of the following two alternatives holds true. So either this uh, factor map is, um, is chaotic. So Q is chaotic in the sense, as I said, of weak mixing. So these are called weakly mixing factor maps. I will come to the, what that actually means uh, soon. Or it has a structured part. So either it is chaotic or it has a structured part. And that means that I can factor my map Q into two parts. So I have an intermediate factor, which I call Y Psi. And I can write Q as a decomposition of two factor mappings, such that this diagram here commutes. And this uh, Q2, this second map now, is structured in the sense that it has discrete spectrum. So yeah, this is just another word for structured here. So Q, uh, Q2 has, um, has uh, relative discrete spectrum. I could also say it is structured. It's probably more understandable. Has relative discrete spectrum and is non-trivial. So non-trivial because otherwise, so if Q2 is an isomorphism, you can always factor your Q in such a way, then it wouldn't be a real uh, claim. So here I want that Q2 is not an isomorphism. It shouldn't be trivial and it should be structured. So really it's a dichotomy theorem between structured chaos. You have chaos or you have a structured part. Okay, but now let me come to why this actually, uh, yeah. This is related at least to, to the contents of this conference, because the claim is that this dichotomy result, this which I have now formulated purely in terms of measure preserving systems and ergodic theory, is actually a statement of a dichotomy statement uh, of operator theory. So this has in in essence, this has nothing to do with measure preserving systems, but uh, yeah, this is my claim for this talk. So this this is really in essence, an operator theoretic result, an operator theoretic result. Okay, and uh, to prove to you or to demonstrate why this is the case, I want to simplify the situation a bit or uh, admittedly considerably, I want to uh, simplify the situation because now I will um, only look at systems. So here there's a dichotomy result for factor maps. Instead, I will now prove the same dichotomy for systems instead of uh, this relative situation. So let me uh, start with the second section. And now I will make precise what I mean by these uh, notions of weak mixing and discrete spectrum. So this is a definition, and basically the only definition of this talk. So uh, what, what do I mean by weak mixing and by discrete spectrum? So we consider a measure preserving system. And again, this should mean that X is a probability space and phi is a transformation of that space. And now uh, we look at the induced operator. I promised you some operators. So here is one, this is the so-called Koopman operator. We just take a function f and pull it back with my dynamics on our base space on phi, on x, so with phi. And we do this for every f in some LP space. And here I consider the L2 space, the Hilbert space case. This is the so-called Koopman operator because it was introduced by Bernard Koopman. And it's very effective, a very, very effective tool to study measure preserving systems. And here we can use it to define these two notions, these notions of chaos and structure. So we say that X phi, um, yeah, is, so this is the first property, 
has uh, is weekly mixing. So it's weekly mixing. Um, if, and there are a number of equivalent ways how one can define weak mixing, I will do so in a very short way. I say that the product system x times x with the product action, so phi times phi, is an ergodic uh, measure preserving system. But probably if you are not familiar with ergodic theory, you are also not familiar with this notion of ergodicity. So let me also say what this means. So this means that this product system has no non-trivial sub subsystems. So you find no non-trivial uh, invariant subsets of positive measure or of measure strictly between zero and one. Or, and this is now again an operator theoretic formulation uh, and probably easier to understand even. So uh, if you look at the operator, the Koopman operator of the product action, which I will write down in this fancy tensor not notation, then if I take, uh, take the fixed vectors of this operator, so all elements, all functions, which are fixed under my operator, these are just the constant functions. So I could say they are just spanned by the constant one function. So of course, the constant one function, if I shift it, it doesn't change, but there should be no other, uh, no other uh, fixed functions of my operator. So this is weak mixing and typically examples of such systems would be shift systems. So if you have ever heard about Bernoulli shifts, these would be the classical examples of weekly mixing systems. So this is the first uh, uh, class of systems we want to consider. And the second is the systems with, with discrete spectrum. So the structured counterparts, so has discrete spectrum. If, uh, what does that mean? And again, we can, um, we can define this operator theoretically. And it just means that if I look at the L2 space, then that this is already generated by, uh, yeah, basically the small invariant subspaces, so the finite dimensional invariant subspaces. So I look at all subspaces of L2, which uh, are uh, yeah, finite dimensional, and such that my operator leaves them invariant in the sense that uh, it maps M to M. And what that means is, in the end, your your Copeland operator, your operator is of a very nice form because it you, it is already uh, described by by its restrictions to finite dimensional spaces. And of course, a finite dimensional uh, an operator on a finite dimensional space is basically just a matrix and is uh, yeah well understood. So really, discrete spectrum is very structured behavior, whereas weak mixing is some sort of chaotic behavior. And a prototypical example of such discrete spectrum systems would be rotations on groups, on compact groups. For example, if you take just a circle and you rotate every element around the same angle, this would be a classical example of a system with discrete spectrum. Okay, now we have, uh, I have recalled, or I have defined these two notions, um, which appear in the theorem in the dichotomy result and I've now written down again the dichotomy result in the case of systems here. So what does it say? It say, says that um, for a measure preserving systems, either the system is chaotic in the sense that it is weakly mixing, and I have written down in red what that means, it means there is no non-constant, so no non-trivial fixed function, or uh, I find a structured factor, so a factor with discrete spectrum, and this basically says that I find a finite dimensional non-trivial invariant subspace because if I have discrete spectrum, I find finite dimensional invariant subspaces. And yeah, basically this dichotomy comes down to a relation between finite dimensional invariant subspaces on one hand and fixed functions in the product. So really the dichotomy just makes a relation between a finite dimensional invariant subspaces of my original space L2 and non-trivial, non-constant fixed functions in the product space. So yeah, and now here, here you, you see that this all is very operative theoretically and this relation between 
finite dimensional invariant subspaces and fixed fixed elements in the product. This is purely operator theoretical, and you can prove this dichotomy result in this uh, more general language. So uh, let me let me tell you how this works in the general situation. So you can forget about all the Copan operators if you don't like them or if you are not so familiar with them. We just take any unitary operator and we look at instead at of the the product system we now look at the tensor product Hilbert space which is the replacement in this abstract setting and we look at the the unitary operator on the on the tensor product and then yeah as i said i have to relate finite dimensional invariant subspaces so and i can of course always pick an orthonormal basis for this so if this is T invariant subspace, I want to construct fixed vectors in the tensor product from that. And this is very easy to do, or yeah, at least if you if you uh, know what to what you what to write down, you just take the uh, orthonormal this orthonormal basis of your finite dimensional invariant subspaces, uh, take the tensor with with itself basically and sum sum it up. So and in this way you really obtain an element of the of the fixed space of the tensor product. So it's not hard to construct fixed elements in the tensor product from a finite dimensional invariant subspaces of your original operator. So in this this direction is easy. Uh, but now the real yeah abstract dichotomy result comes into play or the what is behind this dichotomy result and this is the following purely operator theoretical key lemma which tells that if you have a unitary operator and you make this construction as i just did so i take all these orthonormal bases for finite dimensional invariant subspaces and i look at these uh, vectors here then these already generate my fixed space so my fixed space is uh, generated by them um, and this is really everything you need to prove the dichotomy in the end, because now if you have a non-constant fixed function in, in this for your Koopman operator, then you also find finite dimensional invariant subspaces and vice versa. So really, if you are not weakly mixing, then you find a structured part and the other way around. So this is really the heart of the dichotomy result. And yeah, now let me, so this, this basically, uh, then finishes already the proof of the dichotomy result. So let me only say uh, some words about how to prove this key lemma. And this is uh, also not too difficult because if you know some things about Hilbert spaces and operators in Hilbert spaces, you might be familiar with the, with the term of a Hilbert Schmidt operator. And if you look at this tensor product, then one can prove that this is in a canonical way isomorphic to the Hilbert Schmidt operators. And so if you translate this property of uh, in H tensor H czar to, uh, to the Hilbert Schmidt operators, then uh, you just have to basically get the spectral theorem for compact operators or Hilbert Schmidt operators to obtain this, uh, this equivalence uh, or this description of the fixed space. So this is only a sketch or only the idea, but you just have this is just a straightforward con consequence of the spectral theorem for, uh, for compact operators. Okay, so this basically proves the dichotomy result, and now this is the I, I'm already done. But uh, this is, as I said, only the easy case of systems. And if you want to construct this tower, or if you want to prove this general first maximal dichotomy, you you have to uh, do a bit more sophisticated stuff because ordinary Hilbert space theory is then not enough anymore. And this is basically what we did in our uh, research article. We generalized this whole idea, but in a straightforward way, um, and replaced Hilbert space theory basically with uh, with operator theory on so-called Kaplansky Kaplansky Hilbert modules because they were in introduced by Irving Kaplansky already in the fifties. But if you do this, you um, 
you can do everything in the same way, basically, and still obtain the dichotomy and the key lemma. And so you prove this uh, celebrated Fürstenberg Zimmer structure theorem in a very operator fashion. And on top of it, because you do it in this abstract way, you get rid of uh, a lot of assumptions of countability and separability. So in, in the end, you get a statement for general uh, measure preserving systems in the sense that the acting group could be a general group and uh, the probability space is any probability space. So um, this generalizes the original statements in a fair amount. So uh, yeah, thank you very much. This is everything I, I wanted to say. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments? No questions? 